My name is Kubo. I look after my mother mostly. What was father like? He was just like you. Strong and so handsome. Ugh, <laughs> mother. I use magic to tell stories. And that was a clip from Kubo and the Two Strings, which just won the Best Animated Film of the Year from the National Board of Review, which puts it on the road to Oscar. It's the latest film from acclaimed animation studio Laika, creators of Academy Award-nominated films Coraline, Paranorman, and The Box Trolls. Joining us now to discuss is Kubo and the Two Strings director, producer, and CEO of Laika, Travis Knight. Welcome, Travis. Great to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. Congratulations. The film is getting lots of buzz. You have some new uh, acclaim to tell us about this morning. Do I? It does. <laughs> didn't it also get nominated for the Critics' Choice yeah, Award? Yeah, no, we, uh, we've been, the, the, the film has been very well received mm. by the critics and by the audiences. It's, it's really heartwarming. Yeah, so we, the, the Broadcast Film Critics Association just nominated us for And best, you've got some good competition film. there. Yeah. competition indeed. Absolutely. So tell us how, you, because you've done a series of well-received films now, but they're all so different from each other. How right. do you decide what kind of film to make? Fear? <laughs> I, you know, when I think about the kind of films that we want to make at the studio at Leica, we, uh, you know, we, I come from a philosophy that, you know, stories should be thought-provoking and emotionally resonant and have dynamism in the storytelling. So we're always trying to tell a different kind of a story. We're trying to tell, use this medium of animation to tell powerful stories that resonate with families. And so that means we, we tackle a lot of different stories in a lot of different genres, and I think it keeps the medium really fresh and, and exciting. So does the story come first and then you match the animation? Or yeah. is, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the process of making one of these films is glacial. It takes forever. Like Kubo, it took us over five years to make. Amazing. So the beginning, you start with an idea, you develop it, you you know you write a script, you do storyboards, and it's not until well into the process you're actually animating. Like the last couple of years is the animation, but it's not. It, it takes a good long while before you even get there. And you use stop action technology. Yeah, whatever. it's explain it's, how that works. Stop motion is a technique that really goes back to the dawn of cinema. Uh, you know, the earliest uh, filmmakers like Georges Méliès. That those are some of the techniques they were using to bring their films to life. And the simplest idea is that you have a set. Usually, it's just essentially a tabletop, and you have these little puppets. With with these little metal skeletons inside and lights and a camera just like here in the studio and a frame at a time you just move the puppet a little bit you take a picture you move it again you take a picture you do that enough times and it looks like it has an inner life that must take forever it does <laughs> yeah on a good week an animator will get maybe four or five seconds of footage a week so you, your animators are very patient people patient but also really focused and really disciplined mm -hmm. i think that's what it takes more than anything else is being able to concentrate on minutia for a long period of time so one character let's say Kubo, how many different facial expressions can Kubo make? So we use a, a really interesting technology, something that we innovated on Coraline, where we use rapid prototyping or 3D printing technology to bring these, these characters to life in terms of their faces. So they're all little replacements, they're little masks. And so we print thousands upon thousands of faces to give all the different expressions and phonemes that come out of their mouth. So all the different combinations, Kubo has about 48 million different expressions which is way more than me. I have maybe four. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. more than most humans. Yes. So tell me about your, your history in animation. Did you always love to draw as a kid? Yeah. No, I've been an artist my whole life. I've loved animation my entire life, and I've been working in animation for 20 years. I grew up uh, on the outskirts of Portland, Oregon, and so the, the, you know I didn't know a single human who was a professional artist. So the idea that you could make a viable career doing, uh, you know, making puppets move for a living didn't even seem like it was remotely plausible when I was a kid. But somehow I found myself into this life, and it's really been an amazing thing to build this company to to gather together this community of artists and to make these beautiful films. You know, in some ways, I guess you're sort of like the the indie answer to DreamWorks, right? Do you, do you have a little bit more freedom, do you feel? Yeah. yeah you control know, the company? Yeah, I think, you know, there, there, there are a couple of great things that come with being an independent animation house. I mean, you do have more freedom. You can tell different kinds of stories. You can take greater risks. But at the same time, there, it's slightly terrifying because you're not part of some multinational media conglomerate, which means every time out, we've got, we've got to perform. Well, tell me something. I've always wondered why an animated film chooses to pay a lot of money to stars to voice the roles when you don't even see them. I mean, you have Matthew McConaughey mm -hmm. and Charlize Theron, fantastic actors. Right. But does it really make that much of a difference to an animated film? It makes all the difference in the world to have the right vocal performance. You know, an animated performance, the the what you see on screen, is a combination of two things. It's a collaboration between the vocal performance of the actor and the physical performance that the animator provides. And the vocal performance comes first, which means that we record the actors in the recording 
recording studio, you know, well in advance of when we do the animation. And then what the animator does is he'll, 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 he or she will listen to that performance over and over again to try to get ideas for how to physically bring these characters to life. So if you don't have a really strong vocal performance, all the burden goes on the animator. It really is a, an incredible collaboration. So getting the vocal performance right first is the critical So player. the vocal performance was done years ago? It was done a long time ago, yeah. In fact, the, the boy at the center of the film, uh, uh, Kubo, uh, an actor named Art Parkinson, when we started, he, he was about 12 years old, the same age as Kubo. Within six months of him being cast on the film, his voice had dropped about two <laughs> oh, octaves. Oh, so no. His voice is deeper than mine now. He couldn't even do the voice <laughs> He's anymore. going into college That's now, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so great. So how, what is it about the animation that really resonates with you personally? I mean, how do you make the emotional experience of these characters resonate through animation? Well, I think to, to start with, animation is, it's a, it's a, it's a stylization of reality. It's slightly detached from reality. And once you remove yourself from reality, you can explore different kinds of stories. You can explore different aspects of the human condition that takes the bite out of it a little bit because you're not looking at real people. It's something that is stylized, which means you can tell a story like Kubo, which deals with some pretty heavy themes. It, it, it explores loss and maturation and, and healing. And, but you can do it in a stylized way so even kids can understand. I right. think that's the beauty of animation is that it's kind of a graphic desolation of an idea. So it's universal. Yeah. And where did you find the story of Kubo? Kubo was a, a story that we developed internally at our, at, at, at our studio. The original idea came from our character designer, uh, Shannon Tyndall. And what excited me about it was to tell a story that was evocative of these great David Lean epics or, yeah. or, or Kurosawa myth, but in miniature. Yeah, well, that's great. Can you give us a little hint on what might be next for Leica? Something. A something. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're working on it right now, actually. We're shooting our next film, which will be out sometime in 2018. Oh, fun. We can't wait to yeah. see it. Thank you so much, Travis Knight, Thank for coming you. to see us.